So on to our featured topic, sleep. We have two phenomenal uh, internationally known um, people, researchers, professors in the area of sleep. Our first is Dr. Susan Redline. She is the Peter C. Farrell Professor of Sleep Medicine at Harvard Medical School. She directs programs in sleep and cardiovascular medicine and sleep medicine epidemiology at Brigham and Women's and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Dr. Redline's research includes epidemiologic studies and clinical trials to better understand the origins of sleep disorders, including the roles of genetic and early life developmental factors. And she also works to understand the consequences of sleep disorders on cardiovascular disease and other health outcomes, and how intervening to improve sleep can improve health. She's a leader both nationally and internationally in the sleep research community. Dr. Chuck Seisler is the Baldino Professor of Sleep Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He directs the Division of Sleep Medicine at Harvard and is the Chief of the Division of Sleep Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He has more than 30 years experience in the field of basic and applied research on the physiology of the human circadian timing system and its relationship to the sleep-wake cycle. You'll understand what that is. <laughs> For more than a decade, he served as the team leader of the Human Performance Factors Sleep and Chronology Team at NASA which is responsible for developing sleep-wake schedule guidelines for use by NASA astronauts and mission control personnel during space exploration. His groundbreaking work has also helped to elucidate the impact of sleep deprivation on the performance of young physicians in training. He's received many awards as an, a and is a member of the Institutes of Medicine of the National Academy of Science. So please join me in welcoming both Drs. Redline and Seisler. I'm going to begin, thank you. Thank, thank you for you taking the time to be with us today. And I'm going to begin by acknowledging from the audience that we are so grateful. We asked you to submit questions to us, and we heard many of you loud and clear, and you'll hopefully see some of the questions that were the most common integrated into uh, our interview uh, today. So I'm going to start, you know, we, we've heard a lot about sleep, and um, Susan, I'm going to call you Susan and Chuck if that's okay for today. Susan, tell us, you know, we know that, you know, we go to bed and we sleep and it's rest, but tell us what exactly is sleep? Yeah. Sleep, that's a, actually a very tough question, and it's something Chuck and I spend many hours and sleepless nights thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, sleep is it's not a coma. It's not a state of unconsciousness. But what it is is it is a distinct neurophysiologic state where the electrical activity of our brains change and reduce our sensitivity to environmental stimuli. It allows us to sleep at night, whether we're asleep, or whether we're awake really reflects a balance between neurotransmitters or chemicals in our body that are on one hand alerting and in the other hand sedating. And when in fact that balance is tipped, you actually have a switch in the brain that allows the tipping to go. And it was, it was actually discovered by one of our colleagues here at Harvard. The electrical activity slows down. And actually as we go to sleep, that electrical activity in our brain goes through cycles. And the frequency and the amplitude of the electricity our brain generates changes. And what that does is it has enormous impact on both brain and body function. Brain function, because as the electrical activity of our brain changes over the course of the night, we actually, the, the nerve cells in our brains connect in different ways, in some ways strengthen, and that has influences on learning, memory, and in children, brain development. And also, when the electrical activity changes, it interacts with areas in our brain that release hormones and proteins, including reproductive hormones, 
as well as influences areas in our brain that control our nervous system, and in fact, the autonomic nervous system that influences blood pressure and heart rate. So sleep is a very complex process that's integrated with many other body systems, and I'm really influenced by lots of in inputs that influence that alerting and sedating um, sort of qualities that we face every day. So it is, uh, it is pretty complicated. <laughs> and um, I, I think that, uh, so I would imagine, you know, as we think about problems with sleep, it's, it's pretty complicated. So Chuck, you know, we know that your area of expertise, one of your areas of expertise is really thinking about the biologic clock. Now when we all think about the biologic clock, a lot of times we're thinking about the reproductive biologic clock, but here we're going to talk about that circadian rhythm clock. And I would say if you, if you interviewed women and men, women tend to have more problems with sleep over the life course. Is there a difference between those clocks, between men and women? There is, Paula. The internal clock in the brain that controls the timing of sleep and wakefulness each day, that wakes us up each morning and that sends a signal that allows us to go to sleep at night, that internal clock is a collection of about 50,000 neurons on each side of the brain that together are the size of uh, the head of a pin. And <clears throat> that internal clock drives this daily cycle of sleeping and wakefulness. But in women, the internal clock runs a little faster than it does in men. It's just a tiny bit faster. It's about six minutes. The intrinsic cycle is about, if you were left to your own devices and weren't exposed to the daily cycle of light and darkness, because we have a special facility at the Brigham Women's Hospital where we can shield people <laughs> from all periodic changes in the outside world. We can put them on a Martian day, we can have them working at night, we can have them shifted across time zones, but we can also <laughs> measure the period of this internal clock. And we did, we, we put people in the hospital for a month at a time, and we studied 150 different people, and we found... You got 150 to uh, do that, huh? We did. <laughs> it's kind of an amazing thing. <laughs> Anybody who wants to sign up, there's going to be a sign-up <laughs> card in the back. <clears throat> and so uh, when we did these studies, we found that the, that the intrinsic cycle in the brain, and every organism has its own uh, period of this internal clock, whether it's a plant opening up its leaves in, in the daytime and closing up at night, or whether it's an animal running on a wheel. Anyway, uh, and women have, in, uh, on average, about a six minute shorter period than men. So the average woman has a period that's about 24.1 hours, and the average man has a period that's about 24.2 hours. Now that may seem totally ins ins insignificant, but it adds up day after day after day, so that the, the pl if, you, if, if, a, if a woman and a man are on a, the exact same sleep-wake schedule, going to bed at the same time each night, waking up at an, exactly the same time each morning, the same exposure to light, everything else is the same, the time at which the woman releases the sleep-promoting hormone melatonin in the evening will be about an hour to an hour and a half earlier huh. than the time that the man does. And by the same token, in the morning, the wake-up signal is going to be coming an hour to an hour and a half earlier than it is in the man, even when they're on the same sleep-wake schedule. And three times as many women have a shorter than 24-hour period of this intrinsic circadian clock than do men. And that turns out to be a watershed event because if you have a period, it didn't much matter in the old days when everybody was going with the sun rising and sun setting. But now that we have artificial light, uh, it, it, what, what happens is that it's the evening exposure to light that needs to reset the circadian system to a later hour in people who have a shorter than 24 hour period. Whereas it's morning light that drags it back from 24 hours if you have a longer than 24 hour period. And we think that that's one of the reasons why women have a much higher prevalence of insomnia. Because if you have a shorter than 24 hour period and you're staying up with the rest of society to try to participate in events, even though in the evening you may be exhausted and, and ready to fall asleep at dinner time, uh, because there is a five to six hour range of times at which this sleep promoting hormone melatonin is released, uh, it's suppressed by electric light. So so you have a situation where if the timing would, would have people going to bed earlier, but they have to stay up late with everybody else, and then finally everybody goes to bed, now the woman is going to be waking up much earlier because her internal alarm clock for wake time is going to be happening earlier. 
So we think that that, that may, and, and we just published this uh, a, a year ago. So, so it's, 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 it's a very new finding. That, that's, that's amazing because, you know, if I think about my own experience as a physician and the number of women who come into my office, and particularly as we age, I would say particularly kind of in the postmenopausal years, and who come in and say to me, you know, I go to sleep and then I wake up four hours later. Hmm. Um, and I can't go back to sleep. So there's a real biologic reason there for is, that. Uh, there is, but I have two things to say about that. So first of all, it, it may be happening with women more commonly for that reason. But it also is true that that's the way we used to sleep before we had electric lights. We didn't have a consolidated bout of sleep at night. So if you go back a couple of hundred years ago, before we were trying to cram all of our sleep into one block, people would go to bed at around sunset they would have their deep, slow wave sleep at night at the beginning of, of three, four hours. Then they would wake up. Uh, they would take care of the animals. They would visit each other's houses. In fact, it's, it's speculated that most uh, children were probably conceived during that interval. <laughs> <coughs> and then they would go back for this sweet sleep for the second half of the night, a lighter sleep, greatly enriched in rapid eye movement or dream-associated sleep. And this whole notion that we should be having this consolidated, that, that's really convenience of the Industrial Revolution, that everybody should sleep in one block, not nap during the day, work all day, uh, and then collapse you know, late in the evening when they're so sleep deprived they can't stay awake, and then sleep through the night. But we didn't really evolve to sleep through the night. So now the notion that if you wake up in the night, you have to go to the doctor and get a, get a sleeping pill is really just uh, an artifact of our industrialization. Well, we're not going to turn the clock back. I think it is fascinating. <laughs> and um, so I think the question is, what do we do about that? So I'm, Susan, I'm going to turn to you because, you know, thinking about sleep over the life course, and, you know, I'm thinking particularly about two periods, menopause and then this older fa phase of, of aging. You know, we're not going to go back to the farm. And what, are, what, are we, what should we be do thinking about? Well, I think uh, Chuck gave some hints about some of the issues we have to think about. And I think there are two problems to be distinguished. One is what we just talked about is the timing of sleep, is sort of when, we're, you know, when we go to sleep and when we wake up. And the other is sort of the quality of the sleep, the, the, the ability to maintain high quality of sleep without frequent awakenings. In fact, those are two key aspects of insomnia. And in fact, both of those aspects are very common in, in women in the perimenopausal um, um, age, as well as women who are getting older. Again, characteristic of insomnia, three, four times higher in women than in men. So if you think about issues about timing, you can go back to some of the biological, physiologic studies that Chuck has done and think about what can be done in that evening. So um, if, if, in fact, the socially desirable behavior is to sleep later in the morning, that may mean going to bed a little bit later and then shifting your clock by exposing yourself in the evening to bright light while when you're waking up in the morning, making sure that everything is dark and cool. And so that may be one approach. Some people use melatonin and you know, other such stuff. And we're going to talk a little yes, bit about medication. To shift that. So one would be the timing of sleep. The second issue is really the quality of sleep and this frequent awakening that may happen. And that may really also be a manifestation of a number of things. We heard so eloquently about the link between depression and sleep. And in fact, mood problems, and, and including anxiety and depression, which often do happen you know, as we get older, have big, big inputs into our sleep quality. And in fact, poor sleep is actually a risk factor not only for developing depression, but for re relapsing once you have depression. So one of the things that have to be dealt with is treating those <coughs> mood problems and doing things that you can reduce those stimulating levels of stimulating or arousal stimuli in your system. Some of it is relaxation, some of, you know, and uh, some people are doing yoga now and to try to sort of reduce that level of tension. The other thing and probably one of the most effective things would be to um, really embrace a, a variety of things that we call under the rubric of cognitive behavior therapy. So there are things that we could do to try to keep our sleep schedule regular 
because we don't want to confuse that circadian clock. We want to go to bed the same time and wake up the same time. We want to keep the conditions in our room conducive to sleep. That means a cool temperature because temperature is a very important input to sleep. The cooler, the more likely we are to go into sleep. And we like to avoid things that stimulate us like caffeine and um, alcohol before bedtime and exercise close to bedtime because that will raise your body temperature. So there are certain things we can do to sort of make it easier to stay asleep by reducing, you know, it, addressing stresses, reducing um, anxiety levels, in um, creating conducive conditions to sleep. And, and, you know, if we think about the, the specific period of menopause, without a doubt, you know, you've got the middle of the night awakenings with hot flashes, et cetera. I think you've given us some very good clues around the room temperature, et cetera. You know, I think there, when, when we kind of withdrew, not withdrew, but stopped using hormones as frequently, I think many women are left feeling as if there's no option. What, what, what do you think about hormone replacement therapy? Yeah, so again, I think that was a big blow to many people. It was a big surprise to a lot of people in the medical community. And I think in general, we like to try to avoid any medication that isn't absolutely necessary. So we like to try to encourage the, 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 the environmental changes of keeping the room cool, ice pillows, and so forth. Some people find low doses of antidepressants that have sedative effects may also be effective for those vasomotor symptoms at night. But certainly, disrupting someone's sleep is something we shouldn't ask anybody to do. So it's, it's fairly well accepted that for those people where those more simpler measures um, don't work, that short doses with the lowest possible dose of hormone replacement therapy should be considered an option after discussing risks with your doctor. So one, one thing I think is a clear takeaway, and I think after I've talked with both of you, is that the question about sleep in terms of your own health and thinking about your, your visits to your primary care doctor, it needs to be kind of part of the screening. Are you sleeping, right? Um, one of the things I'd like to ask the group, how many people got between four and six hours of sleep last night? Three? Yes, in a row, in a row. Four to six, seven to nine. Oh, you, you, actually, they've done, they've done pretty well. That's actually... How many people Not don't bad. know? <laughs> but, but the four to sixes, you're going to need more. Um, well, keep, keep, I want to keep just mind, get Paul, back. Keep in mind, Paula, that if you asked that question when I was growing up, only 2% of the audience would have raised their hands with less than six hours and six. of sleep. And we had so the fact that we had 20 to 25% of the audience is, yeah. uh, it's a tenfold increase. Yeah. Oh, uh, in just a couple of generations absolutely. in the number of people who are sleeping less than absolutely. six hours. Absolutely. I just want to hit on medications for a bit because, you know, um, one big question is when, when should we be thinking about the use of a medication and what are the range of medications and kind of how do, how do they, how are they used to either help or, or support sleep? And, and Susan, tell us a little bit about what you think. Well, I think we've all acknowledged the terrible trauma and the horrific events of the last week and its acute impact on sleep. And there's some of us who found that so disturbing, you know, that in fact we still suffer sleeplessness over that anxiety and trauma. So a well-established role for hypnotic medications, sleeping medications, again, after consulting with your doctor, would be for acute short-term dealing with such stress that you can't sleep well. And the, pr the reason for that is to really interrupt really pathologic responses to not being able to sleep, which then could cause more stress, which then could cause more sleeplessness. So, so hypnotic medications have a real role in treating acute problems, especially after major life events or major traumatic exposures. Now those individuals who have more chronic insomnia, some of them actually may benefit from certain sleep medicines as well. There are newer classes of medications, we call them the non-benzos, that have less side effects than in the past. But in general, a, a take home message is that those medications alone are not as effective as something that we call cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is really a group of behavioral education, 
relaxation, sleep hygiene, interventions to really teach and train yourself to have positive attitudes toward sleep, um, to, to follow sleep habits and create an environment conducive to sleep and to engage in certain relaxation behaviors to reduce that arousal levels to allow you to sleep. And in fact, medications plus CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is actually the most effective long-term strategy and maybe CBT alone itself is sufficient. Okay. Melatonin. Chuck, tell us about melatonin. Well, melatonin is something that uh, we studied a lot at the Brigham. And we find, so, so it is that hormone that I told you is, is normally released in the uh, hour or two before we ordinarily go to sleep at night. But it's, th there's a range of times at which it can be released. It's interesting, so, so the circadian timing system, this internal clock in the brain, actually sends out the strongest drive for sleep near the end of our waking day. It provides us with a second wind. So instead of sending its strongest drive for alertness in the morning when we get up, it's actually sending its strongest drive for wakefulness just before we go to bed. And the strongest drive for sleep is uh, emitted from this internal clock just before we wake up in the morning. So it's totally, it's totally paradoxical and contrary to what we might think. And that's why if we get a lot of light exposure in the evening and shift our circadian system later, suddenly now the melatonin is not being released until after we want to go to bed. And then that makes it harder to go to sleep. Also, if we, if we you know, put on, uh, you know, if we go in front of the lights to wash up in the, in the evening just before bed and it's the same lights that we put makeup on in the daytime, then those lights are going to be suppressing the release of the hormone melatonin because it's very light sensitive. So that's like sending a signal to the brain that it's daytime, uh, do not go to bed now, shift your circadian rhythm so it's not only more difficult to fall asleep tonight, but the next night and the night after that. Not a good plan. Um, <coughs> So melatonin is normally released. So, so you imagine the brain is sending out this stronger and stronger drive for wakefulness as the day wears on. And then when you release this hormone, which is timed by the internal clock, the cells, uh, uh, the 50,000 cells that I was describing to you are covered with melatonin receptors. As soon as the melatonin locks onto those receptors, that stops the firing of those cells and turns off this internal alarm clock. So one of the studies that we did was to say, okay, when you travel to, for example, Japan, uh, it, it might be helpful to turn off that internal clock when your clock is saying stay awake on Boston time, but you're actually in Japan. And so we put people on crazy schedules where every day they, we were moving their sleep by four hours, uh, again for a month. And um, don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> and when we did that, we found that melatonin could actually not only allow them to fall asleep faster, but give them an extra half an hour or three quarters of an hour of sleep when they were sleeping at a time of day that they don't normally release the hormone. So it can be effective, but it's tough to get pharmaceutical grade melatonin. In fact, we were doing a study for the NIH and they required us to send in all sorts of uh, demonstration of the purity uh, of melatonin. When, and, and a lot of the stuff you buy at the pharmacy that says melatonin may or may not have melatonin in it because it's a food supplement. Uh, and therefore is regulated by the food section of the FDA, which doesn't test for purity, rather than the drug section. Um, but we did find, after looking all over the world, Switzerland, England, and so on, one of the postdocs found that there was a little company in Sudbury, Massachusetts called Pure Encapsulations. Uh, this took us about eight months to find. Uh, <laughs> and, and it was two towns away from where I live in, in Sherborne. Uh, <laughs> And at Pure Encapsulation, and for some reason they don't sell it in the stores, you have to go to pureencapsulations.com. But anyway, you can get you actually get pharmaceutical grade okay. melatonin, and you shouldn't take more than about a 0.5 milligrams. Okay. And, and w w when would you take it? You would take it about an hour before your bedtime. Okay. And I, I think one of the very common uses might be in <coughs> teens who have trouble really getting to bed. This is unlike maybe the older person who is getting to bed too okay. early. So that, and also jet lab. So those would be, again, when you really right. want to change the timing, get okay. to bed early or get to bed when you, your body's having trouble. Okay, okay. good. So light <laughs> makes a huge difference. And, you know, I mean, I think that we, we're learning uh, from what you're sharing with us that really our environment and thinking about light in our environment makes a very big difference in terms of our ability to sleep. Think about the way we are connected, right? We are connected all the time, whether it be iPads, iPhones, 
um, you know, uh, uh, our, our uh, other television that's in the bedroom. Um, clearly, we really need to be very careful about that. Chuck, I know you've done a lot of work on the types of light. Just tell us just very briefly, wh what, how should we be thinking about light? Well, uh, light, as I mentioned, suppresses the release of this hormone and shifts the biological clock. And the problem is we're on the cusp of a real revolution in lighting. Uh, and that revolution in lighting is going from the old incandescent light bulb to solid state lighting that's powering all of the screens and that is now going to, and it's lighting up the outside of buildings. If you go to New York and so on, you see whole facades of buildings uh, lit up showing scenes and whatnot. That's all coming from solid state lighting or light emitting diodes. Unfortunately, the cheapest diodes uh, start out with blue and try to make it a little uh, longer in wavelength so that we can see white, but it's greatly enriched in the very wavelength. So, so it, 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 it turns out that the, that the circadian system depends not on the rods and cones, but on a newly discovered, uh, intrinsically photo, in, in a newly discovered set of intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells in the retina. So you can, and we discovered a number of years ago that some blind people who have no conscious light perception, we can still reset their circadian rhythms with light that they can't see uh, because of this, uh, these intrinsically photosensitive ganglion cells. Well, they, are, they use a different photopigment, not the same as rhodopsin or the pigment in cones, but it's called melanopsin. And that is most sensitive to the very blue light that is coming in this whole revolution of lighting. So if you sit there uh, in front of a screen, that's giving off what seems like white light but has so much blue light, that is going to be most effective at suppressing your melatonin, making it harder to go to sleep, shifting your circadian rhythms, and so on. So, so we really have to be careful about that exposure, particularly in the evening between dusk and when we go to bed at night. So I think the lesson here is no iPads, <laughs> no email, no computers, and get the TV, if possible, out of the bedroom, or at least don't watch it before bed. Right? Ideally. And think about that in terms of our children. Um, I think for our children, that's a major, it's a uh, major issue. It's a huge problem. Kids are getting one and a half to two hours less sleep per night than they did a century ago. And it's no wonder that one out of 10, 12 year old kids are now being diagnosed as ADHD because the symptoms, uh, sleep deprivation in kids doesn't manifest by being tired. As every mother knows, you know, if, if, a, if, a, if an infant's not getting enough sleep, they get cranky, they have difficulty focusing attention, they, they, they're difficult to manage, and that same thing happens even through school. Uh, and, and so it, we're really doing a disservice to our kids when yeah. we jack them up with caffeine instead of giving them enough sleep. Absolutely. So I just want to move to this notion, I mean, clearly sleep is part of wellness. It is such an incredibly important part of wellness. Let's just get back to some basic facts. What is the right amount of sleep? We, we saw kind of the, the numbers of four to six and seven to nine. Susan. Yeah. Well, it is, again, a really tough question. Paula, you give me a lot of tough questions <laughs> here. But in and, and there is likely some individual um, variation. But in adults, like most those short sleepers who I hate who get so much done all the time. <laughs> but they are not necessarily healthy. Okay. Um, and in fact, we, we, and after studying thousands and thousands of people in many settings around the world, we know that in general, Optimal health in adults are in adults who report somewhere between seven and nine hours of sleep. So that's the sweet spot. And in fact, as you get less than seven hours, in particular going less than six, five, and four, at every increment, every health risk that we have studied increases dramatically. And I'm talking about diabetes, heart attacks, strokes, and even a number of cancers. So in fact, that short sleep that a quarter of you, you know, sort of raised your hand about, we know operates as a risk factor for many of those chronic diseases that plague us. So once again, a major issue for wellness. And tell us a little bit about, Chuck, you've shared some really interesting data with me on sleep and weight loss. Yeah, well, it's... For those who are attempting weight loss. It, it's an amazing study that was just uh, that was just carried out at the University of Chicago, in which they they put people on a, a, a caloric restriction diet in the hospital, very carefully maintained, uh, and they had one of the groups sleeping an insufficient amount, less than six hours a night, and the other group uh, getting an adequate amount of sleep. 
and three quarters of the weight loss, they all lost weight, three quarters of the weight loss in the ones who were also on the sleep diet where they weren't getting enough sleep uh, was in lean body mass rather than fat. And those who were getting enough sleep lost twice as much fat. So what's happening is, and we don't know how metabolism and sleep got connected sometime during evolution. It may, I mean, I've speculated that, that uh, since, since other animals don't generally stay awake uh, voluntarily except when they're starving, somehow during evolution the two systems got connected. And so we go into uh, this mode where we're squirreling away all of the food and trying to retain it as fat if we are not getting enough sleep. Uh, whereas uh, if we are getting an adequate amount of sleep, then our metabolism changes and even our insulin sensitivity changes. And, and we've also shown that circadian disruption is another risk factor, so shifting uh, time zones. And you don't have to travel to do that. There's a new phenomenon of social jet lag where people on weekends are shifting the timing of their sleep by four or five hours compared to where they're sleeping during the week. And that is very disruptive to the circadian system and the systems that control metabolism, uh, the risk of obesity, diabetes, and so on. I mean, it's such a fascinating area and one where we could probably spend an entire session just on, on this, but I think all of us can relate to when we're sleep deprived, what do we reach for, right? Just think about, think about it. Um, Susan, I'm gonna end just by, by asking you, you know, sleep and sleep deprivation, and, and um, Chuck, you've coined the term like vitamin deficiency, sleep deficiency. Sleep deficiency really is a public health problem. This is, we're all experiencing our own issues, but it really is a, a, a public health problem. And you've done some really fascinating work in the city of Boston uh, looking at sleep. So share that with us. Yeah. Well, one of our interests has been in health disparities in general. And we know, and many people have known for some time, that individuals from lower income, in particular minorities from lower income, are at much higher risk of hypertension, stroke, diabetes, premature mortality. And there's many potential explanations, access to care, um, a whole host of genetics, a whole host of factors. And the area, the missing link, but none of them really explain these market disparities completely. So one of the leading hypotheses is that in 